I want to start with a story about this, this young man who had a dog. He lost his dog, and he loved his dog so much. He put a sign in the lost and found, and he put it in social media, and he put there, lost dog, three legs, oh no, blind in left eye, missing right ear, tail broken, recently castrated, answers to the name, lucky. <laughs> Do you feel unlucky sometimes? Do you feel unlucky? What's the opposite of unlucky? What's the opposite of unlucky? It's not luck because we don't believe in luck. It's blessed. Can you all say blessed? Blessed. blessed. Friends, we're starting a new series on the Beatitudes of Christ. And Jesus had a great Sermon on the Mount, beautiful Sermon on the Mount. And there he told his people, let me tell you what it really means to be blessed. Do you want to be blessed? All of us. We all want to be blessed. The title of our message today is Brokenness to blessedness. Can you all say that? Brokenness to blessedness. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is actually Matthew chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7. The Sermon on the Mount is not just the Beatitudes. It's the entire three chapters, 5 to 7. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 10 this afternoon. Let's all stand and read this together. Verse 1 says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wonderful. Please have a seat. As you know, this Sermon on the Mount was given by Jesus on a mountainside. And if you join us every year to go to Israel, you will see this mountainside. And what's wonderful is that it is still untouched. There are no communities, no condominiums, no, no people living in this area. This is the area right here. And it's facing the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful area. It's high up on a mountain, and there's a natural amphitheater. So when you're in this spot up, up there, looking down and you speak, your voice just goes all the way down. It's, it's just a beautiful acoustic in that area. How many Beatitudes are there? How many Beatitudes are there? There are eight Beatitudes. Can you say eight? Eight, eight Beatitudes. These are eight statements of Christ that offer the best definition of a disciple in the New Testament. These Beatitudes offer the best definition of a disciple in the New Testament. In the passage it says... His disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Friends, Jesus was giving a job description of his disciples. That's what it was, a job description. Not only a job description, but a job description with benefits. For each job description, there was a benefit to go along with it. The word here, disciple, is the word student or learner. Student or learner. You see, in Jesus' day, they didn't have colleges. Young people did not go off to college. What they did is that if they wanted to be an apprentice, if they wanted to be a, a fisherman, a carpenter, a, a, a shepherd, all they would do is apprentice under one of these masters. They'd follow them, observe them, work with them. Like if you wanted to be a shepherd, you followed the chief shepherd. And you did whatever he did. He tells you what to do, you follow it. You observe him, you ask him questions. And you work with him to the, po to the point where you start smelling like sheep yourself. Okay? You just go about that day, day today routine until finally you become a shepherd yourself. If you want to be a carpenter, you look for a, a master craftsman and you apprentice under that man. You work for him, you do whatever he tells you to do, you get his tools and you practice with his tools little by little until you become a carpenter yourself. And this goes for whatever occupation that you want to, to do, occupation, profession. You were a disciple and your teacher was often called master. That's the way it went. So it's, un, it's not unusual for these men to be following Jesus. You have to understand that 
Here at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus did not yet choose his 12 disciples. There were people who just followed him. They heard Jesus. They were admiring him. They were inspired by him. So they wanted to follow him. They wanted Jesus to teach them to be like him. So in the beginning, there was actually 500 people. They all called themselves. We're students. We're learners. We're here to, to study Jesus. And they followed him wherever he went. As Jesus would teach and they would hear him, they would say, uh-oh, this is not for me, and they would leave. And you would see that the disciples in number started to decrease and decrease until Jesus chose his 12 disciples. So here, the first disciples are following Jesus, and they're with him together with all the crowd in the Sermon on the Mount. And for three and a half years, Jesus was teaching these men, making sure that they watched him, they listened, they observed, and they asked questions taking in everything that Jesus had to teach them. His plan for training them was very simple. First, you learn by watching. Then you learn by doing. And then you learn by teaching. Watching, doing, and teaching. And that's why the Great Commission is just like that. In Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20, it says, Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to, teaching them everything I have commanded you. Friends, you and I, we're likewise to be disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus Christ. We must fulfill the Great Commission. Why? Because these were Jesus' last words. These words were like his last mission, his last mission for us to accomplish before he ascended into heaven. These were very, very important to him. This is called discipleship. CCF, friends, is a disciple-making church. That's what we are. Every member in CCF is to be a disciple who disciples others. So you're first a disciple, and then you're a discipler. That's the way it works. True disciples of Jesus Christ are those who disciple others. I encourage you not to just be a member of this church, coming in and out on Sundays, going to Bible studies once in a while. Don't be just a member. Be a disciple, first and foremost, of Christ. And then whatever you learn, whatever you... you you learn lessons, you pass that on to others. You disciple other people. Because our spiritual life does not end and begin in this hall. It starts when you go out. As you go out into your world, your circle of influence, that's where you start living a life so that people can see what Christ is really like and that they'll be attracted to Him and want to know Him as well. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I... Can you imagine that? Jesus, I chose you. Every single one of you, I chose you. And he says, and appointed you. Notice, what is his appointment? That you would go and bear fruit. We need to go and bear fruit. See, friends, there is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But what he's talking about here is a different fruit. This is the fruit where you go and make more followers of Christ. That's what we're to do, make followers of Christ. Jesus phrased the Great Commission perfectly. He was, as a teacher, he would say to us, I made you my disciples. I taught you everything you need to know. Now, go and make other disciples and teach them everything I taught you. That's the discipleship, passing on what you've learned to others. The Christian church for the past 2,000 years must focus on discipleship, passing on the teachings of Jesus to others. The Beatitudes describe the inner qualities of what a true Christian disciple looks like. Let me say that again. The Beatitudes describe the inner qualities of what a true Christian disciple looks like. Notice, this is the list. He is poor in spirit. He mourns over his sins. He is gentle. He hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He is merciful. He is pure in heart. He is a peacemaker, and he is persecuted. When I look at this list, friends, I say, who can come up close to these standards? Who can even come up to these expectations? Can you? It's like this is impossible, and really it is impossible if we try to do this on our own. We cannot achieve this on our own. What I'd like to do is go through eight weeks of breaking down each and every one of these Beatitudes so we can truly understand what do these truly mean? 
What was the message behind each one? And allow Jesus to teach us and allow us to walk in this path. We need to follow this, friends, because you'll spot a disciple in the crowd. You will see, one of the, you'll see these eight qualities in their life. This is not a buffet that you can pick and choose which beatitude you like. No, this is a package deal. Jesus is saying, if you are my follower, if you are my follower, I expect you to have these characteristics in your life that will lead to conduct. So conduct must flow out of character. Conduct must flow out of character. A Christian is one who embraces and embodies the Beatitudes. Now, the truth is, friends, you and I will never be perfect. We'll never be able to achieve all of this in perfection. Don't be pressured. Don't worry. God will take you one step at a time. He knows what you can handle. Jesus is challenging all of us to truly examine the condition of our soul. And that's the purpose of this message today. The objective is for each and every one of us to really search our hearts, to see where am I, Lord? Where am I in comparison to what you, where you want me to be? Seriously, look at your lives as God sees you. And if there's something in your life that you feel is not right, then I pray that this message will speak to your heart and that you will make adjustments, you will humbly admit and make those changes that you need to do to be a true disciple of Christ. Friends, Christianity is a journey, and we're all going on this journey together. The word beatitude comes from the Latin word beatus. Can you all say beatus? Beatus. And beatus means happy or blessed. Happy or blessed. Now, the word blessed comes from the Greek word makarios. Can you all say that? Makarios. And makarios means divine joy, perfect happiness. Do you like that? Makarios, divine joy, perfect happiness. This means it's, a, it's like an inner sense of satisfaction that does not depend on outward circumstances. Why? It's an inner satisfaction. Do you want that? I certainly want that. I certainly want that. That's happiness deep inside. Whether or not things happen on, on, around you or not, you've got this deep satisfaction in your heart. It's a deep-seated knowledge of understanding that God graciously approves you, accepts you, and favors you. He has forgiven you. He has redeemed you. He saved you. What more, can you be, what more can you ask? Friends, if I were to ask you, are you happy? That's a tough question, right? Are you happy? Friends, most people's happiness tends to go up and down, all because of the situations going on in their life. Listen to this truth. Happiness does not depend on your external situation. It depends on what? Your internal disposition. In other words, happiness should not depend on whether you live in the Philippines or not. Happiness does not depend on whether you have a lot of likes on your Facebook page. Happiness does not depend on whether you have debts or not. Happiness does not depend on, on whether you lose 20 pounds or not. Happiness does not depend whether you're married or not. Happiness does not depend on, on whether you have a boyfriend or not. It doesn't matter. Now, as shocking as this may sound, your happiness does not depend on anything that's external. Nothing. But the problem is, most people, they seek to be happy. They seek to be blessed. And they look for these blessings outside in, in the world. It's the fame, it's popularity, it's money, it's uh, possessions, it's power, it's sensual pleasure, all of that, which is really fake happiness. Friends, the word blessed, blessed is also a statement of how God sees and approves how people live a certain way. So when you hear the word blessed, it's not only from what you experience, it's but how God looks upon you. Blessed is like approved by God. That's what blessed means. Now, Max Lucado, a Christian author, he wrote a book entitled The Applause of Heaven. And in that book, he paraphrased the Beatitudes. And this is what he came up with. God applauds the poor in spirit. He cheers the mourners. Continue. He favors the meek. He smiles upon the hungry. He honors the merciful. He welcomes the pure in heart. He claps for the peacemakers. And he rises to greet the persecuted. 
Amazing perspective. The question to all of us today is this. In your heart, do you want the approval of God more than the approval of others? That's a really important question. Do you want the approval of God much more than anything else, more than your family members? Do you want the approval of God more than your business workers, co-workers? Is God's approval more important to you than your friends? Is God's approval for you more important than your closest loved ones? Let's realize, friends, that if we want God's approval more than anything in this world, then these beatitudes should lead us to change our attitudes. Behavior must flow out of belief. Behavior must flow out of beliefs. And that's what these Beatitudes are all about. They show us what a disciple looks like. And it also tells us how we can get God's approval from heaven. Two very important things. Let's take a closer look at the very first one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It says there, everyone, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you first hear this and read this, you say to yourself, What's going on? I don't really know what it means. It, doesn't, it sounds very clear. We know what the word poor means. We know what the word spirit means. But poor in spirit, what does that mean? <clears throat> the best way to describe this is to answer the question, what does it not mean? What does poor, poor in spirit not mean? Well, first and foremost, it does not mean being in poverty, having no money. Because Jesus never said, blessed are the poor. No, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's something totally different. You never hear people who are poor say, I'm so blessed. That doesn't work, right? Very few people would say that. So when, when Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, what did he really mean? Well, number one is to recognize, to recognize your true condition before God. See yourself as God sees you. What is your condition? Another one is to, it describes a person who is utterly helpless, completely desperate for God. At the same time, it's a person who's totally empty of self and filled with humility. Empty of self and filled with humility. Now, friends, this is only realized when you come to know who God is, when you really get to know who God is and see Him for all that He's worth. You, you look at yourself and you see yourself as nothing, nothing in comparison to God. This enables you to see how poor in spirit you are. It's the exact opposite of being rich in pride. Now, in the message translation of this verse, the Message Bible says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Can you imagine that? What a translation. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. And I realize that when you're at the end of your rope, that's where God is. When you can do nothing else, when you're totally helpless and hopeless and, and you're at the end, your last straw, it's, it's God himself who's there for you. From the very beginning of the sermon, Jesus was saying that you and I don't have the spiritual resources in of, of ourselves to put Jesus' teachings into practice. We can't do it on our own. But we are blessed when we realize that we're spiritually bankrupt. And when we come to that realization that without God, we can't fulfill this, but then with God... He can help fulfill it in our lives. He can allow us to be and do all that He created us to be and do. Here's the best definition of broke, a poor in spirit. The best definition is to be broken and desperate for God. Can you all say that? To be broken and desperate for God. Until you and I come to the point that we're so humbled, we're so broken, we cannot and we will not Admit our desperate need for God. Are you with me? This is crucial. You know, as I look around, I notice that so many of you here were, were proud before you came to Christ. Would you agree? You were proud in your past, but when you gave your life to Jesus, you all became humble. Is that right? How many of you are humble? See what I mean? Yes. A friend once said, I was once conceited, but now I'm perfect. One day, a young monk was searching for a secret. So he went up to look for the old wise monk up in the forest. He traveled and traveled overnight, and he was looking until finally he got to the really dense forest, and he found a small little hut, 
and he knocked on the hut, and the man who came out was the, was the wise old monk with long hair and a beard. And when he saw the monk, he got down on his knees, and, and the young monk, you know, said, oh, sir, I honor you, and I'm here because I want to know the secret of humility. Please tell me the secret of humility. The older monk says, I cannot tell you, but I can show you. Follow me. So hand in hand, they walked in silence all the way to a river, and they entered the river. As he held the young monk's hand in his arm, he held him, and they walked to the river. When they got to about waist deep, the older monk got the head of the young monk, and he dunked it in the water. And he kept it down in the water. And he was struggling. And the young monk was flailing his arms. And he was going wild. He couldn't breathe. And as soon as he saw that the young monk was going blue and ready to meet St. Peter, <laughs> he lifted him up out of the water. And the young monk just, just grasping for air, grasping for air. He couldn't believe it. He just almost drowned. And the, young, and the young monk was so angry. But the older monk just looked at him and says, If you can be as desperate for God as you are desperate to breathe right now, you will find the secret of humility. Class over. The lesson's ended. Friends, are we as desperate for God as we are to breathe oxygen in this earth? Are we as desperate to live for God as we need oxygen to breathe on this earth? Do you really want that? Do you really want to know God, to live for God? Do you want the happiness that only He can give you? Do you want the delightfulness, the exuberance, the joy that only He can give? Let me say it again. Happiness does not depend on any of your external situations. It depends on your internal disposition, how you are with God. In other words, happiness depends on your attitude, on the attitude of your heart. It depends on the attitude of your heart. There are three common attitudes of the heart. The first one is pride. The second is self-pity. And the third is broken or humbled. Three different attitudes of the heart. Which one are you today? Look at this crazy scenario, okay? There's a plane that loads all these crates of fresh, uh, crispy 1,000 peso bills, Okay? And it's loaded up, and the plane takes off, and it's on its way to a destination. And on the way, two engines catch fire. And the pilot says, you know, the only way to save the plane and the passengers is to throw out the cargo, throw out the, the crates. And sure enough, they open the cargo hold, and they throw out all the crates of money. And the crates of money start falling and, and opening, and all this rain of 1,000 peso bills come falling down on a special place, on this special location. And there just happens to be three men walking by. And, you know, as they're there, all of a sudden, in comes Mr. Proud. He walks in, and he's boastful. He thinks he knows everything. He acted as if, he's acting as if he, he's God's gift to man. He feels he's self-made. He's got everything. Little does he know that he's the most insecure person in town. Well, you can tell by his posture, you know. His favorite posture is his his arms are crossed over his chest. He stands proud. He's uh, got a bad attitude. He's always tight, always stiff, always closed. And then the blessings of, of money come showering down on his, on his... Yes! There it is. As the, as the rain of money comes down, he's not even paying attention to it. I don't need this money. What do you think I am, poor? I'm poor. I'm not no beggar. Besides, if I get this money, I'm going to have to pay you back. And I'll pay you back double. I'll pay you back double. I'm not poor. I'm not poor. And it touched the floor. It's already dirty. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> so he keeps his arms folded, his chest so proud, doesn't catch a single paper bill. Do you know people like that? I don't. <laughs> but this is the truth. The truth is, there's no shortage of God's blessings, but there's only a shortage of people too proud to receive God's blessings. Let's talk to him. Huh? Let's talk to him. Excuse me, sir. Uh, how long have you been jobless? 
like five years. <laughs> five years. And in those five years, you've had no job offers? People have not offered you a job? No, no, no. I've gotten them. I've gotten them. But I'm only going to take a job that's a manager's position. See, see, companies need to know the value that I can give them. Mm. Companies need to know that I deserve a manager's position. And besides, it's, I, I don't take any jobs that are not less than an hour from my house. I don't want to take the bus. It's dirty. <laughs> if, if it's longer than two hours, my dad has to drive me to work. Your, your dad? You mean you still live in your house, your parents' house? Yes, under their roof. They feed me. They give me a good allowance. Yes, they do. All of that, huh? I hope you don't mind my telling you, but you know, you are not desperate enough to work. And desperate people are the ones who are successful. They're the ones who get ahead. Can I ask you, are you hungry? A, a little. <laughs> you need to eat humble pie. You need to eat humble You should just be a messenger. You should take a job as, as a messenger. You can go to work in a bus. Who cares if people see you? It doesn't matter. You see, humility brings favor to God. In the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6, it says there, God opposes the proud, but gives what? Grace. grace to the humble. Gives grace to the humble. In many ways, pride prevents you and I from receiving the grace of God. In walks Mr. Self-Pity. Mr. Self-Pity always feels sorry for himself. He's always thinking about his, his problems. He's obsessed with his misery, with the, the way that life has dealt with him. Look at his posture. His eyes are cast down. His hands are limp. <laughs> he likewise falls under the reign of cash, God's blessings upon his life. Wow. Wow. Because of his posture, self-pity doesn't even see the, the cash coming down. His eyes are too focused on his problems of himself. He doesn't see what's coming down from God. Have you met jobless people whose, whose attitude is always grumbling, complaining? Have you met people like that? Well, friends, let's talk to him. Excuse me, have you tried applying for a sales job? The world is not fair. God doesn't love me. Not, nothing is happening in my life. Everything is going against me. I didn't finish college. Oh, I'm already 46 years old. Do you believe that? 46, huh? <laughs> and I'm also sickly. See? I don't know how to sell. I don't, I don't think I can sell. Have you tried applying to be a call center agent? You know, they take people like you, your age. I, I feel out of place. Everyone, everyone, everyone there is very young. And plus my mama told me not to talk to the strangers. Call center, no? How about starting your own business? Have you tried starting your own business? I'll surely fail. Of course you'll fail, but you know, we all fail, but you have to get up. You can't quit. You have to keep on going. You, you cannot stop. You have to start over again. I, I can't take failure. I'm not sweaty. <laughs> up to now, I, I haven't won the lotto. See, I'm a failure. <laughs> It's impossible to talk sense to someone who's so full of themselves. He won't listen to solutions. He just wants everyone to pity him. That's it. If he only knew what the Bible says in Psalm 53, verse 12, it says there, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. In walks Mr. Broken but Blessed. Mr. Broken but Blessed. 
He was a man who went through many trials. But after going through the trials, he's come out victorious with Christ. He likes looking up in the air because he's, he likes seeing what God has in store for him. Wow, truly blessed. Can I ask you, do you believe that God's sure. blessings come to you abundantly? Yes, all I have to do is look up there and I see all the beautiful blessings around. In fact, when I wake up in the morning, I would always say, good morning, Lord, instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning again, right? Wow. Now tell me, tell me, tell me, do you have problems? Yes, lots of those. And, and how do you overcome these? How are you, how are you so happy? Well, all I had to do was to realize that I had to trust the Lord with all of my heart and not to trust nor to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I have learned to acknowledge the Lord and He made the path of my life, of my life, really, really straight. And how did you gain this attitude? Well, there was this one huge trial which hit my life very, very hard. So I tried my own way. I insisted on my own. I thought I could make it, and just before I knew it, my life was already crumbling down. I was so helpless, and I was so desperate, and it came to a point that I had to humble myself and look up to Jesus and believe that He died for me, that He rose again from the dead, and I placed my faith and trust in Him. And only then I realized that only Jesus Christ can fill in the void I have in my heart. Psalm 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Friends, when you're broken by God, you're more open to receive lessons and life from Him. Let's give a hand to the three men, huh? It doesn't end. <laughs> do you break or do you bounce? Do you break or do you bounce? Friends, in life, the, let's say, for example, the ground is the hard trials of life. Those are the hard trials of life. And would you agree that trials of life do not disappear overnight? Yeah, just like pimples, they don't disappear overnight. Okay? <laughs> Eye bags don't disappear overnight. Wrinkles don't disappear overnight. Your husband does not disappear overnight <laughs> and reappear as Piola Pasqua the next day. That doesn't happen. But no, let's get real. You and I, we have problems, and some of our problems are major problems like sickness, relationships, money. And when we're faced with these problems, we have a choice. We have a choice. What are we going to choose, friends? Are we going to break or are we going to bounce? Do you believe that God allows trials in your life for a purpose? Yes or no? Yes. yes, and I agree with you. Oftentimes, we get into trials because of our own sinfulness. We get into trials because of mean and malicious people. Friends, but God allows all these trials to happen. Life is full of choices, but at the same time, life is full of potholes. Would you agree? We have a lot of potholes in the Philippines. Potholes, you have small medium and large, and mega extra huge large, okay? And when you see these potholes, as you fall into these potholes, these are the trials, and you have a choice. You can either break or you can bounce. I've got news for you, friends. God wants you to break. Don't be shocked. He wants you to break. It sounds bad, but it's good. Listen to this. If you and I would just bounce... If you and I would just bounce, the trials are there, and we're bouncing. We're bouncing. Are we learning anything? No. You and I are continuously going through the same trial over and over again. We're suffering through the lesson. We're not learning anything. We're suffering through it, and it's wearing us out. It's wearing us down. But God wants us to just break. He wants us to just break. Understand that being broken does not mean destroyed. God will not destroy you. He wants to break you to make you new again. 
He wants you to make, make you new again. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 10 says this. We are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, always carrying the body of the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested, may shine through, may be glorified through our bodies. As you go through difficult trials and, and brokenness, it doesn't mean that you're going to be destroyed. It means that God's going to use that in order to make you better. In this world, friends, broken things are often despised and thrown away. Think about it. Anything we no longer need, what do we do with it? We throw it away. We throw it away. Damaged goods are rejected. And that includes people. In marriage, when relationships break down, the tendency is to walk away and find someone new rather than work on reconciliation. In our world today, it's full of people who are broken, broken spirits, broken hearts, broken relationships. Friends, does brokenness happen just once in our life? No. Brokenness happens over and over again. There is something about reaching the breaking point. When you reach that breaking point, it causes you to be humble. It causes you to seek the Lord more sincerely. King David is a perfect example. He was, once was a broken man. He was so broken, he cried out to God in Psalm 51, verse 10 and 17. He cried out to God saying, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and contrite heart, broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. There are some things that need to be broken, and that's our pride, our self-will, our stubbornness, our sinful habits. Those all need to be broken. Isn't it true, friends, that oftentimes we are so concerned with one thing that we put above, over, over and above all other things, and that one thing is our self-esteem, our self-worth. We put that over and above so many things. We build up our, our personalities so we look good to others. We look good through success. We look good through physical appearances, how we dress, what makeup we put on, what jewelry, etc. We try to please other people all because we want to gain their, their affirmation. We're so vain. We're so self-centered. We'll do anything we can just to get others to like us, to appreciate us, to approve us, to validate us. We're so selfish for attention. And oftentimes, we'll compromise our morals, we'll compromise our virtues just in order to be able to achieve status, achieve significance. That is totally opposite of what a follower of Jesus Christ does. You see, friends, one who's committed to God, who's truly committed to Christ, knows that they are nothing to God, nothing to God. We are absolutely nothing. And our reputation is worthless. We don't have anything to prove to anybody. We need to focus on God and please Him, get His approval. The poor in spirit are those who are concerned and conscious of their sin. And they, they know that they're completely lost and that they need God's grace and oftentimes they feel unworthy of that grace. The Bible says that God breaks those who are stubborn and rebellious. If that's you today, there will come a time that God is going to break you. You can either break or bounce. It's up to you. But if I were you, I will not resist God. Because Pharaoh, the mighty Pharaoh, at one time in his life, challenged God. He challenged God. And what did God do to him? In the book of Leviticus chapter 26, Verse 13, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. Continue. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. You see what God did? God was the one who broke the yoke of bondage of Pharaoh and set the people free. To us, broken things are oftentimes despised. Broken things are worthless. We set them aside. But God can take what has been broken and He can remake it into something that's beautiful. 
He can restore it. He can make it something better than it was and use it for His glory. That's what God can do. Broken things and broken people are oftentimes a result of sin. But what did God do? God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who was without sin, and He became broken in order that we might be saved from our sin. Friends, on the night that Jesus had His last supper with His men, He took the bread and He broke it and gave it to them. He went all the way to the hill of Calvary, broken to die that we might live, that we might live. His death made it possible for the broken, sinful humanity to be reconciled to God. Without the brokenness of Jesus, we would not be reconciled to God. We would not be healed from our sin. Without the broken body of Christ, we could not be made whole. We would have no hope. We would have no joy. We'd be helpless. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says this, but he was pierced, this is Jesus Christ, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Only when you and I surrender our lives to Christ can we be restored and transformed. Such surrender takes a brokenness. It takes brokenness. Can you resist brokenness? Yes, you can. You can resist it if you wish, if you choose to, but you're not going to get anywhere. Friends, the prodigal son, in all his pride, took his inheritance from his father before his father passed away. He took that, he went away, and he lived like a, like a bachelor king. He enjoyed his life. He spent it on all kinds of things for pleasure. It came to a point where he ran out of money, there was a great famine. He had no food. He had no work. He was willing to eat the food of the pigs. Friends, that's the most disgusting thing any Jew can ever do. To even touch a pig, it just, it's unheard of. But during that severe famine, he came to the lowest point of his life that he was willing to do anything. In the book of Luke chapter 15, verse 17 and 19, it says there, but when he came to his senses, he said, I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Do you see the heart of the prodigal son? It came to the point where he says, I came to my senses. He came to his senses. You and I have got to come to our senses. We've got to get to our senses. And he confessed. He admitted. He says, Father, I have sinned. He knew he was sinning against Father, his Father in heaven and his Father, earthly Father. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy. Do you see that? Do you see the, the brokenness of this man? He was broken to the core, totally broken. This is what poor in spirit is all about. Now, you're probably sitting there and you're wondering to yourself, okay, what does this mean? How, how do I get broken? How do I get broken? Do I have to pray to be broken? Is that the way it works? Friends, listen to this. It first starts with trials. Can you all say that? Trials. God allows these trials because He wants to get our attention. Are you going through a trial right now? You're either going through a trial or you just came out of a trial, one or the other. But when you go through a trial, friends, listen, don't just bounce, deny it, blame other people, run away. Don't do that. Don't pray to God with conditions. Lord, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, no, no, no. That'll lead to self-centeredness. When you go through a trial, be humbled. Go through humility. Can you say that? Humility. Go through humility. Humility is simply, it's accepting the fact that you cannot do anything and you're helpless on your own. That's what humility is. Accepting the fact that you're totally helpless on your own. And this leads to brokenness. Can you please say that? Brokenness. Brokenness is being completely empty of self and desperate for God. I'm so broken. I need you, Lord. Just like the prodigal son. And from brokenness, it leads you to surrender. Everyone? Surrender. Surrender is crying out to God and saying, Lord, no one else but you. No one else but you. And when you surrender, you confess. Everyone? Confession. 
You pour out your heart to God and say, Lord, I have sinned against you. This is what I've done. This is what I should do. Lord, I, I'm coming clean. That's what you do. You confess. And this is where God can finally start working in your life. Why? Because it's now that you can finally listen to God. Hear the prompting of his voice in your heart. Can you say this, please? Listen to God. God draws us. God calls us. God longs to be with us so he can change us. Oftentimes, we're so distracted by the things of this world. That's why fasting is so important. We're distracted with our problems. We're distracted with our families. We're distracted with our work. We're distracted with our careers and our future and our unhappiness and all these things. We can't even hear God. And so as you go through prayer and fasting, it's a time when you can just be silent before the Lord and really hear Him speak to your heart. Sometimes we must be broken before we can realize that our deepest need is to be reconciled with God, to be intimate with Him. Only then can you and I be made new. Brothers and sisters, when you're humbled, when you're broken, when you're surrendered, you can begin to trust and obey God. Can you say that? Trust and obey God. Then and only then will you discover that your weakness is his strength. Your weakness is his strength. Our solution to trials is never to try to do things on our own. It's never to try to strive with our own efforts, our own connections and all that. No, when you're going through a trial, it takes brokenness, friends. It takes brokenness. When we recognize our desperate need for God alone, when we take our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on Him, focus on Him alone, when we stop thinking about ourselves and start thinking about how Jesus died for us, that's when our life starts getting together. When we stop worrying about our, our life, put God on the center, that's when things start happening. When we confess that we are broken, God makes us into what He wants us to be. The poor in spirit will enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because they're the ones who know and recognize their lostness, their sinfulness. They're the ones who will come before the Lord in humility and, and receive Him, trust Him, and obey Him. Proud people will never understand this principle. And in the process, they will never receive God's promised blessings. In Luke chapter 18, there's a very clear illustration on what poor in spirit is all about. Jesus said, one day, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a self-righteous Pharisee. Feeling good about himself, he prayed like this. Luke chapter 18, verse 11. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Lord, you're really lucky to have me on your side. Can you imagine that? How dare he say all these things? But the other man, who was in a bit distance, he, had, he felt unworthy to enter the temple. He could just stand by the door, bow his head. He didn't even have the courage to look up. He was filled with the burden of his sin. He cried out, beating his chest, God, have mercy on me. A sinner. Two men in the temple praying. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. And let me just tell you that tax collectors in those days are like the tax collectors today, stereotyped to be people of dishonesty, etc. I'm not saying they all are, but that's the same impression people had for them in those days. But this tax collector was broken. This tax collector had been changed by God. You can hear his heart. You have the Pharisee. And the Pharisee, well, he was rich with pride. The tax collector, he was poor in spirit. The Pharisee thought highly of himself. The tax collector, he admitted his sinfulness. The Pharisee, he enumerated his accomplishments. The tax collector, he was depressed by his own sin. The Pharisee, he boasted. The tax collector, he begged. The Pharisee, 
He recommended himself to God. The tax collector, he pleaded for God's mercy. Let me ask you, who was lost and who was saved? The Pharisee, he was lost. But the tax collector, he was saved. Whose prayer did God listen to? The Pharisee's prayer? Well, let me tell you something. Because the Pharisee really wasn't praying. He was giving God his resume. <laughs> but Jesus said, God heard the prayer of the tax collector because he heard the words from a broken, contrite heart. And that's the prayer he listened to. After that whole incident, Jesus gave the moral of the story. He told them, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we are humbled, when we are broken, when we are surrendered, God makes us whole. He gives us a new life, a new meaning to life, a new purpose, a new joy. And I pray that each and every one of us will remember, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Did you learn something today? I really pray that you would apply whatever it is that you've learned and how God has spoken to your heart. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't let weeks pass. Whatever it is you need to do, do it right away. Are you broken enough to listen to my poem? Are you? The title of my poem is? No, it's, it's, it's blessed. Kayo naman? Aneti? Okay, blessed. Here it goes. Blessed are those who know they need God. Nothing in life compares when they're odd. Blessed are those who live lives of simplicity, rather than insecurity, insanity, filled with vanity. Blessed are those who have for forgiven their enemies, turning bitterness to love, making them friend enemies. You've heard that word, no? Yeah. It's a new word, okay. <laughs> Blessed are those who refuse to judge others as they might be biased against their own brothers. Blessed are those who spend hours with God. In silence and solitude, they want to applaud. Blessed are those who share the good news that many may be spared from being confused. Blessed are those who live as citizens of heaven, loving God with their bags packed and forgiven. Blessed are those who receive God's grace, passing it on to others. It's God's eternal embrace. Blessed are those who know success is not in this earth. It's in trusting God for their precious second birth. I love that one. Blessed are those who are broken from God's trials, humbled and surrendered, praising God with their smiles. Blessed are those who are constant, a constant blessing to all. God's paradise is awaiting. Just listen for his call. Praise be to God. From popular request, I put some discussion questions here. Please feel free to take pictures of these. And the purpose of this is to discuss this with your family, discuss it with your small group, get deeper into the message, make it applicable, make it real in your life. Don't let the message go to waste by not discussing it, okay? Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Our loving God, we thank you. We thank you and thank you so much for loving us and sharing with us the secret of life. Lord, it's not about bouncing, it's about breaking, breaking before you, allowing our lives to be truly surrendered in humility before you. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, Father. You know the trials that they're going through. You know the hurts, you know the pains, you know the helplessness that they feel. And yet, Lord God, we know that you are there. You are there to catch them and to restore them and to remake them and to teach them lessons that only you can teach them. May we humble ourselves, Father, before you. 
may we realize that without you, Lord, we're nothing. And so, Father, we ask you to be gentle with us, gentle with our children. Allow us, Lord, to learn lessons with gentleness. Thank you, Lord, for your life and for all that you've done for us. Father, I know that you brought special guests here today, and they're here because of people who love them, who took time to invite them and bring them here today. And we know, Lord God, that every encounter with you is precious. And I pray for all the guests who are here today that they would not leave this place without having a chance to make, the, make their lives part of yours. I pray, Father, that you have spoken to their lives. And friend, if that's you, I pray that you would humble yourself. As I lead you in a prayer, make this prayer your prayer. Lord God, I, I need you. I'm helpless. I'm confused. Many times, Lord, I'm trying to live life my way. But I realize that there's no other way except your way. I humble myself, Lord, today, and I admit that I'm a sinner. I've committed many sins against you, and for that, Lord, I'm, I'm asking for your forgiveness. Father, today I open my heart, and I ask you to come into my life. Today I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for your forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for loving me the way I am. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to pay for all my sins. Thank you, Lord, for embracing me with your unconditional love. Thank you, Father, for making me brand new. I love you, Lord. And I pray for all of us, Father, as we leave this place, that our lives would truly be a reflection of brokenness that's turned into blessedness, that because of our blessings, Lord, we can bless others, and we would lead them to come to know you in a very personal way. Use each and every one of us, Father, to make a, a difference and impact this world. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. We give you all the glory and all the honor that you and you alone deserve. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. I love you guys.